walking with Jesus through the Gospels. We are coming to Bethany, and I want us to remind ourselves where we've been and how is it that we've come to this location now. So turn with me for a moment to Luke chapter 19, and then we'll be going directly to John chapter 11. So we have Jesus in, John, in Luke chapter 19. Entering Jericho, was passing through, and he meets a man named Zacchaeus. And as we had dealt with that in the past, we see that he has just come uh, into Jericho. He has spent time with Zacchaeus there now. Uh, so that here we are in Jericho. And then after he leaves uh, Zacchaeus' place, we see in, in verse 11 onwards, Jesus gives the parable of the ten minas. And in this instance, Jesus is talking about the, um, uh, the, the parallels that are there with, uh, with King Herod. And uh, they are coming along this route when they are seeing this, the, this palace that is set up there. And then Jesus is making his ascent up, uh, the ascent of Adumin, the Jericho Road, and it's this direction here that he has been coming. All right, so uh, as he gets to the top of that Jericho Road on that ridge, so coming into this region right about here, this is what the focus would have been, the, the view would have been like, of course, without those buildings, because those are, um, obviously, it's a picture of, of current day. So they would be taking this direction, where uh, Jerusalem is just over the Mount of Olives in this area. And then uh, we see that this is where Jesus and his disciples, where we are coming to right now, Bethany. So we're coming to Bethany. That's where we will be staying for a few days. Uh, and then Bethphagi, which just helps us to keep in mind the uh, proximities of locations. So Bethphagi is here. The Mount of Olives is just um, to, the, to the west, the northwest of where that is. And then lastly, we see a perspective here of the Temple Mount. So hopefully that will give you some perspective so we can understand where we are right now. So with that in mind, let's come to John chapter 11. So when we were in John chapter 11 previously, we had seen that Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead. But of course, we've gone from then and we went back to uh, Bethany on the other side of the Jordan. But at this point now, in verses uh, 55 and onwards, is where we're picking it up and where uh, our, our journey is continuing. Now the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and many went up from the country to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. They were looking for Jesus and saying to one another as they stood in the temple, What do you think, that he will not come to the feast at all? Now the chief priests and the Pharisees had given orders that if anyone knew where he was, he should let them know so that they might arrest him. So this is the intention of the Pharisees, the chief priests, and uh, we're going to find out shortly that the determination is that they don't want to take Jesus during the feast. They just want him identified, want him pointed out so that they can take action, so they can get his location, and then when the time, according to their estimation, is right, then they will move in and arrest Jesus. In chapter 12 now, this is where we see the location now. Uh, so many people have come to Jerusalem. They're in that region. And six days before the Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So they gave a dinner for him there. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those reclining with him at table. Mary therefore took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, who was about to betray him, said, Why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? 
He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Jesus said, leave her alone so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. For the poor you always have with you, but you do not always have me. All right, so I want to bring our attention to this overview map so that we see Jesus is in this area now in Bethany. Uh, we can see from this view uh, the western slope of the Mount of Olives and then the eastern slope as, uh, I'm, excuse me, the eastern slope of the Mount of Olives here coming onto the western slope of the Mount of Olives and then we have Jerusalem directly ahead and the temple situated right here. So Jesus has come uh, to Bethany six days before the Passover. Matthew and Mark, they indicate to us that uh, the, the, the time frame they're looking at is two days before the Passover. Uh, I'd like you to put markers, a marker in John 12, and we're going to go to Mark chapter 14 and also Matthew chapter 24. Now, one thing that I do for myself, if it's of any help to you at all, uh, when I'm doing a, a few different locations, I'll bend, uh, I'll, I'll roll my pages over. So that's to, from John to the Mark 14. And then I will uh, turn to the other location, which is the Matthew 24 that we'll be looking at as well. Now, uh, excuse me, not Matthew 24, it's Matthew 26. All right, so what I want to look at here, uh, let's look at Matthew 26, verse 1. When Jesus had finished all these sayings, he said to his disciples, You know that after two days the Passover is coming, and the Son of Man will be delivered up to be crucified. He speaks about, or uh, Matthew speaks about then, the chief priests getting together, and uh, they're gathered in the palace of the high priest. And I want to bring your attention to that location here, just so that you get an idea of what that looks like. So this is an overview, a map of the city of Jerusalem. These are the city walls. Uh, here's Bethany in this region right here. And as we zoom in, uh, closer and closer. We're going to see a location right here. It's the high priest's palace. So you see that uh, the temple is right here, and then we've got the high priest's palace circled in red. So this is where they are located at this point in time, the chief priests. They're plotting. This is what John had been speaking about. Um, so John is, at that point, he's He's generalizing because he knows that it's, for him, it's already taken place, but he's just giving that information because that's a convenient place for him to put it. So they're plotting in order to arrest Jesus by stealth and to kill him, but they said not during the feast, lest there be an uproar among the people. It's important for us to catch a glimpse of this and recognize that Jesus is in control here. He's the one that's in charge, not the chief priests, not the Pharisees. It's according to God's timing, not theirs. And so they don't have any intention of arresting him during the feast. They don't want there to be a riot, an uproar. Uh, they have made plans. They'll do it once the feast is completed. But God has other plans because it's necessary that Jesus be crucified during the feast, not before and not after, and that he be crucified and not some other means of death. Well, it's following this directly in verses 6 through 13 that Matthew gives his account uh, regarding the dinner that, that takes place. So Matthew and Mark's account are almost identical. We're not going to get into the nitty-gritty of uh, when these feasts were specifically. Uh, I lean towards the uh, the, the perception that Matthew and Mark, they're doing a flashback to the time that John is speaking about, six days before the Passover, when this meal takes place. But they couch it, 
they place it here when they're dealing with the scheming of the chief priests. Uh, and they, they do a sandwich here, looking at the chief priests with their scheme, and then in verse 28, excuse me, in verse, I get my page out of the way, verse 14 through 16 of Matthew, and similarly with Mark, when he deals with the first part, with the plotting, and then in verse 10 and 11, that last second section is dealing with Judas, that he determines that he's going to uh, make this plan with the chief priests. So both Mark and Matthew sandwich between that scheming a flashback going back to the dinner. Some will hold that it's two separate dinners. And we're not going to d debate that here. I want to focus specifically on what happens at the meal during this and the worship that takes place. If it's two meals, there's two anointings. It doesn't change anything that, because Jesus is still anointed. If it's one meal, then he is anointed both at his head and on his feet regardless of what the situation is. So what I want to do is come back to John, keeping in mind that Matthew and Mark tell us that the woman that is there and John, if it's one meal, names her as Mary, anoints Jesus' head and his feet. Now, have a look at what's taking place that Mary, she is is caught up with Jesus. Look how John starts his account of the meal. In verse 1, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So they gave a dinner for him there. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those reclining with him at table. John gives us the focus of Lazarus, but in that focus of Lazarus, he doesn't stay there. He's making a contrast. See, John places Lazarus here in full view in order to show what Mary's response is. Mary and Martha, they have their brother back, but Mary isn't looking at Lazarus. She is completely consumed and overwhelmed with Jesus. Now, I want to just help us with the, the timing that's taking place here. I want to bring our attention to this timeline. So the top line, the, the blue, is the way uh, Gentile reckoning of time. Uh, the black is Jewish reckoning of time because uh, Gentiles reckon time from midnight to midnight. So that's one day. Uh, Jews reckon time evening begins the day and then sundown the next day is the is the beginning of the new day now let's have a look here sabbath begins at this location here uh, on friday evening then we have sabbath ending on saturday evening let's back up just a little bit jesus stays with Z with zacchaeus in jericho that's thursday night that he stays with him then on Friday morning, Jesus makes that journey on the Jericho Road, arriving in Bethany for the Sabbath. Then the meal takes place at the end of Sabbath on uh, what is now the first day of the week. So for us, it would be Saturday evening. So here Mary is completely consumed with Jesus. She takes a, a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard, and this is something similar to what the, the jar, the flask would have looked like or might have looked like. This is an alabaster flask or jar, and it would be filled with about 12 ounces of this ointment. And the top part of this, the opening, once it's been filled with the ointment, would have had a stopper placed in it, a permanent stopper. And in order to get to the contents, the flask had to be broken at the narrow point of this neck. And as soon as the flask was broken, the fragrance would just begin to fill the entire room. 
we see that the value is indicated for us. Mark tells us the value. John tells us the value. Uh, Matthew tells us it was a very expensive sum, a very large sum. Have a look at how it is detailed for us here. In verse 5, Judas says, Why was this ointment not sold for some of your translations? If your translation says this, the translators are helping us to get an appreciation for the, for the amount or the approximate value. If your translation says about a year's wages. But more literally, it's in the Greek here. Why was it not sold for 300 denarii? And given to the poor. It's important for us to recognize that this is specified 300 denarii, not 305 or 276, um, but it is 300 denarii. Why is that? We're going to look at that in a moment. But we want to see that it's a very large sum that is being uh, poured out, being spent on Jesus, as it were. And it's a sacrifice for Mary. Anything that we do in worship, it's always a sacrifice. If it's not of value, it's not of sacrifice. Well, she is indicating the worship of Jesus. Lazarus is there. She has her brother back. But what's most important to her is Jesus. And so she retrieves this investment that she has made at some point in the past and she decides that she's going to worship Jesus with this ointment. She can think of nothing more valuable to her, and so she begins to worship extravagantly. So she breaks open the, the flask, the smell, the fragrance permeates through the air. And um, for Judas, he's upset about it, he, he looks at this more like an expense than as um, a response of the goodness that he has received from Jesus. But Mary, she gets it. She sees what she has received just in the very person of Jesus, let alone all the blessings that she's received alongside of it. So she's, she's pouring out her heart in joyful love while Judas looks at it as though she's paying some kind of a bill and she's paying way too much in his opinion. Because for him, he sees uh, Jesus as a dead end now. He had seen him as the hopes of, of Israel, that he was going to establish a kingdom, that he believed that he was the Mashiach, the Messiah, the anointed one. But lately he's been seeing that Jesus is is destined to to die. He keeps talking about this crucifixion and being handed over to to the uh, to the Jews, and then the Gentiles are going to take him. The Romans are going to take him and crucify him. He he just can't get his head around it, and he's he's get growing impatient that Jesus is not setting up his kingdom, and so he doesn't see Jesus as worthful to worship. He sees him more as a liability now, and he's debating over where he actually stands in this group of, of followers, these disciples, and whether or not it's worth his while to continue doing so. And we end up seeing that he makes this agreement with the chief priests and the Pharisees to betray Jesus. And he does so for 30 pieces of silver. Where in this instance, Mary, she's pouring out. He's selling Jesus out for 30 pieces, and he's making it look like he's concerned about the amount and could be used for the poor. He doesn't care about the poor, and we're even told as much because he was greedy. He was a thief. He kept helping himself to the money bag. But we have Mary. She's... Um, She's, uh, she can't help but pour out her worship in this respect. The glory of Jesus is more vivid to her than the value of what she is about to give him and what she is pouring out upon him. I want to see that this aroma that begins to fill the room and is, is upon Jesus. So it's not just 
from the contents or from the bottle itself. Now it's emanating from Jesus himself. Uh, from this point on, the gospel writers are pouring their focus on the redemptive work of Jesus. And so we see that um, John, he puts the focus from this point on, just over 50% of his gospel is, is what remains, and he's dealing with the redemptive work of Jesus. Matthew, 33%, so a third. Mark deals with just under 40%, and Luke deals with just a little over a quarter little over 25%. And so their focus on the redemptive work of Jesus is, is, is all that they want to put their attention to from this point onwards. So we see that Mary, she is enthralled with, she's captivated, she's overwhelmed with Jesus, and she does what comes... Uh, to her now, she wants to express that worship that she's being overwhelmed with. This is how she does it. I want us to wonder or to see what's going on here with some of the picture of the the anointing that's taking place. So, if we go back to Song of Solomon, Song of Songs. I want to look particularly in chapter 1. Have a look here, and we see that, uh, let's look at verse 2. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for your love is better than wine. Your anointing oils are fragrant. Your name is oil poured out, therefore virgins love you. Draw me after you. Let us run. The king has brought me into his chambers. Then I want to go down uh, to verse 12. While the king was on his couch, my nard gave forth its fragrance. And so we see some comparisons here with the, uh, the pure nard that Mary uses and pours out on Jesus. Uh, she anoints his head. She, anoint, she anoints his feet. Uh, feet being an um, indication of worship. She anoints his head, that re being an indication of the anointing of as king and also as priest. So in the Old Testament, the anointing of a king and of a priest, uh, even for the tabernacle and then later the temple, it was a very specific ointment that was used and spices that were a part of it, and it was more valuable than diamonds. And only the priests and the prophets could use this in anointing the, the, the uh, priests themselves, anointing the tabernacle and then later the temple, and anointing the uh, kings. And on occasion, prophets were anointed also, but primarily the kings and the priests. And I want us to recognize here that Jesus is being anointed uh, as a picture of his kingship the, as being Messiah. He's also being anointed as priest, for he is going to, to go and offer himself as the sacrifice before the Lord God Almighty on our behalf. So he's offering himself, becoming both the, the sacrifice and the priest who offers the sacrifice, instituting a new priesthood after the order of Melchizedek, as the book of Hebrews tells us, and Psalm 110, as the writer of Hebrews draws that out from that psalm. I want us to pay close attention to something that was spoken about here in the Song of Songs. Your anointing oils are fragrant. Your name is oil poured out. There's the picture here of, of God being poured out. Uh, so his name is oil poured out. How, how do we get that? Well, remember we looked at the specific number that was being used to identify the value of this ointment. Why wasn't it sold for 300 denarii? I want to draw our attention particularly to one aspect of 300 in the Old Testament, so I want us to go back to Genesis chapter 45.
This is regarding Joseph. Joseph, uh, he has now become, has been elevated to the position of vice, uh, vice president of, uh, of the uh, country of Egypt. And he's been reunited with his brothers, Benjamin, his younger brother is there, the youngest brother of all, the 12 sons. And here's what we see takes place once they've been joined together and reunited. Joseph reveals himself to each of and all of them. He gave a change of clothes, but to Benjamin, he gave 300 shekels of silver and five changes of of clothes. What is this? Why to Benjamin does he give 300 shekels of silver and to, to him five changes of clothing? Silver in the scriptures represents a couple of things. One, it represents God's word. In Psalm 12 and verse 6, the word of God is referred to there is that, that the word of the Lord's are pure words. They're refined like silver in the furnace of the earth. And then we see, uh, so that's silver representing God's word. Then we see in Numbers chapter 18 and verse 16, it's in regards to redemption, redeeming the firstborn, whether it be of uh, their sons or the firstborn of their flocks or their cattle. Look at uh, verse 14, Numbers chapter 18. Every devoted thing in Israel shall be yours. Everything that opens the womb of all flesh, whether man or beast, which they offer to the Lord, shall be yours. Nevertheless, the firstborn of man you shall redeem, and the firstborn of unclean animals you shall redeem. And their redemption price, at a month old, you shall redeem them. You shall fix at five shekels in silver, according to the shekel of the sanctuary. And so silver here is a picture of redemption. Now again, we've seen the number five. So five gets in connection with the five garments of Genesis chapter 45. Five represents grace. Five is rep represented in the Hebrew numbers uh, as grace itself. Five garments. It speaks of covering, covering that, uh, that is not deserved. And where we speak of, see redemption, five shekels of silver, it speaks of redemption that is not deserved. And where Jesus, he's being anointed here, one as king, as priest, upon his head, upon his feet, for uh, indicating worship that he is worthy of. And Jesus says that this anointing is for my burial. It's in, it's in connection with his death, his crucifixion, his sacrifice. And so his sacrifice is going to secure, it's going to result in redemption because the word of God is going to be fulfilled. Now, one other aspect regarding 300. In Scripture, in Hebrew, the letter Shin is, uh, repre represents the number 300. So we have Shin here, and Shin is the letter that represents the name of God, Shaddai. Here is the name Shaddai. And so we're reading from right to left. Shaddai is how it's, it's spoken. Almighty. Uh, you might recognize it even more so as El Shaddai. El Shaddai, God Almighty. And the name of God can be abbreviated or represented by this one letter, Shin. And we see that there are mezuzot, or one is a mezuzah, that upon them they have the letter Shin. Notice here it's a stylized Shin, but there's the Shin nevertheless, and it represents the name of God Almighty, Shaddai. And so it may 
have specifically the name Shaddai spelled out on the mezuzah or just abbreviate it with the Shin. And the value of that letter is 300. You remember that in Song of Songs, your anointing oils are fragrant. Your name is oil poured out. So we see that there's this uh, depiction of the name of God represented by 300, represented by um, that sheen, is poured out. And the, this ointment that is poured out on Jesus, it's like the, the, the Lord God Almighty, El Shaddai, is being poured out upon Jesus himself. Your name is oil poured out. While the king was on his couch, my nard gave forth its fragrance. So we have this depiction, this image that is being presented to us here with the worship of Jesus and the worship that Mary is bringing to him and the, the identification that Jesus is portraying and presenting. This is not just coincidental that Mary decides to do this. Jesus comes to Bethany specifically at this point in time to be anointed for this very purpose. And with Jesus, timing is everything. He doesn't do things accidentally or haphazardly or coincidentally. Everything is done with intention and with purpose. Now, I want us to see here uh, that in 2 Corinthians, let's go there for a moment, and chapter 2 and verse 14. 2 Corinthians 2 and verse 14. says, but thanks be to God who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession and through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere. For we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To one a fragrance from death to death, to the other a fragrance from life to life. So, because we are Christ, it's like we take on that same aroma. The name of God is poured out upon us like, like fragrant oil. And the fragrance of Christ is upon us so that we are the, the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing to, to present Christ over and over again. When the king was walking by because he was anointed because of the oil that was poured out upon him there was a fragrance to him it was the aroma of the king the aroma of Christ as it were and that's where we what we see Mary doing at this point now she is poured out uh, upon Jesus and now this aroma is upon him and everywhere Jesus goes over the next few days He's going to have this aroma of pure nard. It's going to be unmistakable. It's going to be unavoidable. No doubt, Mary had some of that fragrance, some of that aroma upon her as she's in such close proximity to Jesus. And, and the aroma just overflows. I want us... To continue on now, come back to John chapter 12. When the large crowd of the Jews learned that Jesus was there, they came, not only account, on account of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So you recall that uh, Jesus is only, at this point, only two miles away from Jerusalem. And so when people get wind of the uh, word of, of the fact that Jesus is in Bethany, they are, have been in Jerusalem, Sh Sabbath is over, and now they're making their way those two miles to Bethany and the surrounding areas, the surrounding villages. Remember, Bethphagi is about this region right here. So people are coming together. They want to see Jesus, but not 
Jesus only, but on account of Lazarus. So as a result of this, the chief priests also made a plan to put Lazarus to death as well. Because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. So it's like the aroma of Jesus was upon Lazarus and everywhere Lazarus was going. Uh, it's not literal necessarily that the, this ointment had been poured out upon Lazarus. But it's like the aroma of Jesus was upon him. And where he goes, people are seeing and hearing about Jesus. Lazarus is pointing to Jesus in every respect. Well, because the religious leaders, the chief priests and the Pharisees, they don't want anything to do with Jesus. They want to get rid of him. They want to get rid of anyone that is connected with him or might point people to Jesus. And for them, Lazarus is uh, at the top of their list at this point. Well, the next day, remember this is the first day of the week, the, the, the morning now. Um, the evening has already begun and the first day is the Sabbath has concluded, Saturday night in Gentile reckoning. It's now the come on to the dawn of the next day. So well into the first day of the week, we look at it as Sunday. And we celebrate this, we refer to this as Palm Sunday. Well, the next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So not only had they come out to Bethany, but the next then they had gone home. Now they are getting word that Jesus is coming to Bethany, or excuse me, to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him. They were crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. Well, Matthew and Mark have already had this account take place in relation to what we've looked at. It was Matthew 26 and Mark 14. The triumphal entry for, in their accounts is Matthew 21 and Mark chapter 11. We see that Jesus sends his disciples on ahead from Bethany into the village ahead of them, so that it'd be Bethphagi, to get a, to, you'll find a colt with her foal there, a donkey with her foal, excuse me, not a colt, but a donkey with her foal uh, tied up, loose them and bring them to me. And if anyone asks, what are you doing? Tell them that the master has need of them. And then Matthew tells us, and Mark as well, and then John does it, um, tells us that this is the fulfillment of Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 9. So Jesus found a young donkey, that is, he sent his disciples ahead of him to Bethphagi, and they brought it to them, to him, and he sat on it just as it is written. Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. So the disciples had gotten the donkey and the colt, the foal, and placed their cloaks upon this colt nobody had ridden upon. And Jesus now begins that two miles, or a little less than two miles at this point from Beth Foggy, and uh, makes his way to Jerusalem. But he doesn't do it in a quick uh, trot. He's doing it in just a, a slow fashion. As people are gathering together, the crowds are increasing. Why does Jesus do this? Why does he do it on a donkey? Why doesn't he, he get something more majestic like a, a stallion? Uh, it's very intentional on what Jesus is doing in this respect. He's fulfilling uh, an aspect of the Davidic covenant that the Lord had made with David in 2 Samuel chapter 7. And he says, that, I'm going to give you an everlasting kingdom. There will never cease to be one of your descendants upon your throne. And he's speaking ultimately about Jesus. There's nobody on the throne of David presently, but what that means is that this kingdom will not come to an end. And Jesus, 
as was told to Mary when Gabriel came and announced that she was going to become pregnant, she was going to conceive by the Holy Spirit, and that being the case that her son, the child that will be born, Jesus, would sit upon the throne of his father David. That's yet to happen. But the kings, when they were uh, anointed, they were anointed to a position of kingship, but they didn't always take their, um, their place as king or rule as king for some time thereafter. Think about David in 1 Samuel chapter 16. When, Saul, when Samuel went to David to anoint him to replace Saul because God had rejected Saul, he takes anointing oil and pours it upon David's head. But it won't, and so at that point, he's anointed. He's the Mashiach, the Messiah. But he will not be coronated. He will not take his place on the throne for another 17 years. Well, David does become king and he rules. And when he's in his old age, uh, Zadok, the priest, David tells him, go and take my son Solomon, place him on my donkey and anoint him as king and then have him ride through the streets of Jerusalem. Look at 1 Kings chapter 1. First Kings chapter 1, and we're going to look at verse 38. So Zadok the priest, Nathan the prophet, Benaiah the son of Jehoiada, and the Carathites and the Pelathites went down and had Solomon ride on King David's mule and brought him to Gihon, the Gihon spring. There Zadok the priest took the horn of oil from the tent and anointed Solomon. Then they blew the trumpet, and the people said, Long live King Solomon. And all the people went up after him, playing on pipes and rejoicing with great joy, so that the earth was split by their noise. Here, when the people see Jesus riding on the donkey, notice what they say. They said, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Here's what they are declaring right here. They are proclaiming Baruch Haba Bashem Adonai. So blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Baruch Haba Bashem Adonai. They are, and then they said, even the king of Israel. So they are seeing in this a uh, picture, a fulfillment from Solomon they, when the declaration was, long live King Solomon. Here they're saying, and even the King of Israel. Now, what they've been doing is quoting from Psalm 118. But Psalm 118 doesn't have even the King of Israel. So, but they are recognizing that Jesus is the King. And see, there, there's a reason that Jesus is coming into Jerusalem on this day. Remember, uh, Yesterday, he was anointed. He was anointed on the head, and he was anointed on the feet. And he is now coming into Jerusalem for, at this point, two reasons. One is that he's fulfilling the, the type that was presented by King Solomon. And so he's coming in riding on the donkey. It cannot be mistaken that this is the way Jewish kings were presented to the people. The people recognize this. They're declaring Hosanna. They get palm branches, and they begin to wave them before the Lord. The thing is that that's something that was done six months ago at the Feast of Tabernacles. They're doing it again now because of the Feast of Tabernacles is when it's anticipated that, that Messiah will establish his kingdom. Zechariah speaks about that as well. We've looked at that in the past. And so with the symbolism that is brought together here, even though it's Passover, they're anticipating him as Messiah. But he's not going to be coronated at this point because he has already told them in Matthew chapter 12 that the time of his visitation, his, he came as king, it's taken away from them now. 
until his return. So at this point, he's simply anointed as king. He's being presented as the anointed one, the Mashiach, but not as the coronated king. Secondly, something that's taking place uh, is that he is coming uh, on this specific day into Jerusalem. Why? I want us to go back to Exodus chapter 12. So because Friday was the six days before Passover, now we're four days before Passover on, this, on the first day of the week, it makes it the 10th day of the month. What's significant about that? Exodus chapter 12 is going to show us. What is Jesus doing? Very intentional with his timing. Exodus chapter 12, and I want us to look at verse 1. The Lord said to Moses and to Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall be for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell all the congregation of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, every man shall take a lamb according to their father's houses, a lamb for a household. If the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his nearest neighbors shall take according to the, near, the number of persons, according to what each can eat, you shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male, a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it until the fourteenth day of this month, when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight. What is Jesus doing here? It's the 10th day of the month, the first month of the year, Nisan. And Jesus is coming into Jerusalem specifically on the, this day, Lamb Selection Day. And the amazing thing is that he's presenting himself as the Lamb of God that is without spot or blemish. Did you notice in Exodus 12 that you are to select the Lamb that is without spot and blemish, and then you are to offer it on the 14th day. Why was this span of time necessary? It was so the lamb that was selected and identified as being without spot or blemish would be seen that there is no injury that had taken place um, earlier that day or a day or two earlier, so that if it had been injured, then it would show up in that four-day period from the selection day until the day of sacrifice. And what's taking place here is that Jesus is coming into Jerusalem on Lamb Selection Day, presenting himself as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And the only way that he can qualify as that is being the Lamb without spot or blemish. And over these next four days, Jesus is going to be scrutinized extensively by the chief priests, by the Pharisees, and by the Sadducees, so that any blemish that might otherwise be there in any other person or spot would be revealed or shown to be there. But as Jesus gets interrogated and scrutinized intensely over these next few days, he, it will be shown clearly and decisively that he is indeed without any spot and without any blemish. And when he stands before the chief priests and then later uh, Pilate and then Herod and then Pilate again, that it's going to be seen that the only thing they can accuse him of is blasphemy because he claims to be the Son of God. But he can't be found guilty in the sense of sinful on that charge because he actually is the Son of God. So they have found, they will have found no spot and no blemish through the intense scrutiny of searching him out. So Jesus comes into the city on Lamb Selection Day. Here we have a depiction of him coming in through the eastern gate, that golden gate, and uh, the very gate that today is sealed up uh, the, the Muslim sheikh, uh, Suleimani, uh, I forget what century, um, several hundred years ago, 
he closed up that gate when he realized that the, the uh, Hebrew scriptures said that he would return through that gate. Uh, so he had reestablished that gate. Three years later, he filled it all in to try to prevent the return of Jesus as the Messiah. But he'll be unsuccessful because there's no brick, there's no stopped up gate that can stop the Messiah, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Praise be to his name. So here we see Jesus. He's coming uh, to the city. So coming down um, from the Mount of Olives in this direction, coming across the Kidron Valley, and then through this gate, the eastern gate right here. His disciples back in John 12 didn't understand these things at first. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. The crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. The reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they had heard he had done this sign. So the Pharisees said to one another, you see that the whole, that you are gaining nothing. Look, the, the world has gone after him. And that was just the beginning. Uh, Church, I want us to see that the scriptures show us very clearly that Jesus is the Passover lamb. Have a look at 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Paul the apostle, here in verse 7, speaks about him very directly and very clearly. He says in verse 7 of 1 Corinthians 5, Cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump as you really are unleavened. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. And so here we have Jesus fulfilling the scriptures. Remember, everything according to the backdrop of Exodus. And here he's fulfilling the scriptures as being the, the Mashiach, um, where he's anointed for burial. It's not coincidental. He uh, is very intentional about the timing and the place. And then coming in the very next day, to Jerusalem, riding on the donkey, showing himself to be the son of David, the rightful heir to the throne, but not yet to be coronated on it. But at this point, because what happens first is that he's presenting himself as the Lamb of God on Lamb Selection Day, the Lamb who takes away the sin of the world. And this is in fulfillment of so many pictures throughout the Hebrew Scriptures, and not least of which... In Genesis chapter 22, when we see that God told Abraham to take Isaac and to sacrifice him, it's a, a picture of the cross. And we see, we've seen it in the past. Uh, after three days' journey, they arrive at Moriah. Three days, speaking about resurrection life, uh, Moriah is the very place where Jesus was crucified. While Abraham and Isaac are ascending the mountain. He has told his servants, you wait here. My, this, my boy, my son and I are going up to worship. And there's no greater worship than seeing Jesus being glorified on the cross, and the death, and his resurrection. And this is what is being pictured for us with Abraham and Isaac. And here's what Isaac says to his dad. Father, we have in verse 8, Genesis 22, Father, we have the fire, we have the wood, but where is the sacrifice? And Abraham says, God will provide himself a sacrifice, will provide himself the lamb. And he did that very thing as uh, Isaac was bound and placed upon the altar in this type of acting out the, the uh, sacrifice, the offering of Jesus. But he could, God would not allow him to carry through because he uh, there was no one righteous to be able to, to be in this place except for Jesus alone. And so even Isaac needed the substitute. And it's pictured when the angel of the Lord tells Abraham to stop and behind him, caught in a thorn bush by its horns, is a ram. And it's silent, fulfilling Isaiah 53, a lamb before its shearers is silent, so Jesus did not open his mouth. He is offered for us willfully, without 
uh, any type of rebuttal or reviling or shouting back. Or He does it willingly because he lays down his life, the very reason for which he came. Lastly, I want us to see in 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter and chapter 1. Remember Exodus 12, that the lamb was to be selected on that 10th day of the month, selected to be without spot or blemish, and inspected over these next four days to make sure that no blemish or spot would had show up from an injury that had been, inc- had been, that had, uh, been incurred. Look what we see here. In verse 18, Peter says, You know that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold. Now remember, silver represented re- redemption, but it's only a picture that the only redemption that can save us, can redeem our lives, is the life, the blood of Jesus Christ. We, but rather, in verse 19, you were redeemed with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb, notice how he speaks it, without blemish or spot. The very same words of Exodus chapter 12. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in these last times. For the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. See, he's telling us here that the lamb was slain or foreknown before the foundation of the world because this was not an answer or a response to man's rebellion and sin. This was God's provision even before man was created and before sin came into existence. And so he already made provision, and his word was, was in place. The promise was made and provided for us. And all that needed to take place was for it to be fulfilled some 4,000 years after Adam and Eve sinned. Even to the point that we see that he's now in these... Um, in these last times, so speaking specifically of when Jesus came, that was he was made manifest in these last times for our sake, who through him we are now believers in God, who raised Jesus from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. So we see this picture of of this anointing, this ointment that was poured out on Jesus, and now the aroma of Christ is upon you and me because of this redemption, this salvation, that we've been redeemed uh, by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. In His name, we praise God Almighty, and we thank the Lord for His goodness and for His redemption. Amen. Amen.